Good evening, everyone, um, to everyone in India, and good morning to everyone in, and our friends in DC, and to all our friends and the panelists who are joining us from different parts of the world. I, on behalf of the Sunday Guardian Foundation and the Global Peace Foundation, would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone to this platform to discuss the issues which are significant for the world today. The world stands at the crossroads with the pandemic uniting the world in our search for solutions to meet the growing challenges we are faced with today. Social inequality, unequal opportunities, and the rise of religious extremism are some other significant challenges facing the world today, which require communities and world leaders to come together towards eradicating these common evils and achieving our common goals. Our founder, Mr. Kartikeya Sharma, has been working towards highlighting these issues through our news network, NewsX, and our daily paper, The Daily Guardian, along with our Sunday paper, The Sunday Guardian. The Sunday Guardian Foundation believes that the world is presented with significant challenges which require collective efforts and our minds to come together, and today's conference is a step in that direction. The Global Peace Foundation shares these common values and its global outlook is reflected in the vision of its founder and the work that the foundation has been doing in the different countries today. We at the Sunday Guardian Foundation believe that a forum for the discussion of these ideas by all stakeholders is important and today's conference is the first step in this direction. We have a very interesting lineup of speakers and panelists who will come together and discuss some of the key issues that we face today. I would like to welcome one of our first speakers and our dear friend, Mr. James Flynn, the International President of the Global Peace Foundation, who is our first speaker. Mr. Flynn, uh, Mr. Flynn has a wide experience working in nonprofit sector for several years. He has worked extensively with grassroots level organizations and educational organizations, strengthening the ties within the communities and working on several youth and violence prevention programs. I would like to request the, uh, Mr. James Flynn to come forward and say a few words. Thank you very much, Dr. Pandit. Global Peace Foundation is very pleased to co-convene this timely forum with our good friends at the Sunday Guardian Foundation. This forum addresses the challenges for democratic pluralistic societies in the Indo-Pacific region to effectively combat extremism while highlighting the bright lines needed with regard to the rise of authoritarian rule. The Global Peace Foundation with its chapters on every continent has long worked toward identifying and strengthening universal ideals and shared values as the basis for social cohesion. Such ideas are embedded in the fabric of societies everywhere. Important examples include Vasudeva Kutumbakam from the Sanskrit, the one human family, and Panchasila, the five universal principles that form Indonesia's national philosophy. GPF founder and chairman, Dr. Hyunjin Preston Moon has uplifted similar foundational values from ancient Korean culture as well expressed in the ethic of Hange Gingan, or living for the greater benefit of humanity. By examining these principles and values further, both from the perspectives of the world's faith and wisdom traditions, as well as scholarly analysis, we seek to grow a deepened basis for Indo-Pacific collaboration and alliances, fostering peace and security, freedom, co-prosperity, and the rule of law. We're grateful to welcome today some of the most incisive minds from both the policy and academic world, as well as our esteemed longtime colleagues in faith traditions who are advancing the moral imperative to build peace with proven models on the ground throughout the region. In this regard, I believe our forum today is unique with its attention to underlying spiritual and civilizational values that are essential to uplift our shared humanity as the basis for consensus and cooperative action. I expect this stimulating discussion will contribute to greater understanding of how nations can effectively address religious extremism 
while safeguarding freedom of religion and conscience endowed by the creator. Many thanks to all of you for, for participating today with special appreciation to our distinguished speakers for sharing their valuable insights and expert analysis. And thanks to again to our friends at the Sunday Guardian Foundation for joining with GPF as co-conveners. The Global Peace Foundation looks forward to continuing this work together to identify broad common interests that can be addressed through mutually beneficial collaboration among the democratic nations in the dynamic Indo-Pacific region. Thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Madhav Nalapat. Professor Nalapat is the UNESCO Peace Chair at Manipal University. Uh, he is the uh, editorial director of the ITV network and Sunday Guardian, and he's a highly regarded analyst on, on peace, uh, policy, and international affairs. And our very dear friend, please welcome Professor Madhav Nalapat. Uh, thank you very much, Jim, uh, for that very generous introduction. I am always delighted to be part of, uh, of the Global Peace Foundation and the Sunday Guardian Foundation's joint efforts to promote harmony and peace across the world. Uh, I would only like to say that if you go by the ancient uh, teachings of, of Sanatana Dharma, it basically means that every path leads finally to the same goal. And I think that goal is the realization of the divine, the realization of the eternal. It may be expressed in different ways. It may be expressed in different languages, but the divine is universal and that there's a unity in the divine irrespective of how we look and how we, we look upon the path that we are traveling. I would only like to say that I'm very glad that, uh, that these two organizations have come together in today for the simple reason, what we are facing today is a crisis in a sense in which efforts are there by, I mean, I would not use the term hostile actors, but whatever, to broaden the fringe at the expense of the moderate middle. A society is healthy when the fringe is shrinking and joins the moderate middle. And a society, gets under tension when the fringes, and I use the word fringes advisedly, I don't use the word fringe because there are different fringes, but when these fringes start taking away people from the moderate middle, then there is a crisis in society, especially in democratic society and India and the United States are the two biggest democracies in the world. I think this is something that we all need to confront and we all need to battle against. And this is a small way of doing it. Uh, as uh, as uh, Jim will, will know, I mean, uh, all of us believe in the principle of what I would call a horizontal world. A horizontal world is a world in which we are different, but, but equal. A vertical world is a world of high, low, middle. That is, that is absolute nonsense. We are all human beings. We are all children of that same divine force. And therefore, our world is or should be a horizontal world in terms of our understanding. And the more we promote that, the better. The last point I would like to make, there is no question of appeasement of extremism, uh, ex appeasement of the fringe, because frankly, there is such a thing as universal values. There is such a thing as universal human rights. There are some leaders who have said universal values, there are no universal values, but there is such a thing. And the fact is that you know, the, these values are, are common uh, aspirations of all of us as human beings. And that is why we call them universal values. And on the basis of these values, there are some universal rights. But, but to get these rights, there has to be a good knowledge of each other. And one of the problems I see across the world, and whether it's in, in any part of the world that I'm visiting, or even the part of the world that I'm staying in, one problem is the limited knowledge that we have of each other's societies, each other's belief systems, each other's practices and traditions. And as a consequence of that limited knowledge, misunderstandings get created, and frankly, tensions get created that often get spilled into violence. So again, I want to say I'm delighted to participate in this. I believe very strongly 
in the equality of mankind, in the very equality that, for example, our constitution and the US constitution have made, uh, have, have given the force of constitutional law. And I, I, I'm really very hopeful that this particular conference will be a step forward. Any step forward is a welcome step. Any step forward, and this I hope will be a good step forward. Thank you, Professor Nalapad, uh, for your insightful uh, rem uh, remarks uh, regarding the purpose of this conference and uh, the uh, importance of what we are trying to achieve today, which is uh, bringing our sh uh, shared values and our shared goals together and strengthening our democracies, uh, which have been working together for a very uh, long time and look forward to working together in the future. I would like to, moving forward, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Dr. Vinay Sahasrabudhi, and thank him for giving us his valuable uh, time for the event. Dr. Sahasrabudhi is a member of the parliament, the Rajya Sabha, and also the president of the Indian Council of Cultural Relations. He's also currently the chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Education, Women, and Youth Affairs. He has co-authored a book titled The Innovation Republic, outlining the key innovations under the leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi. I would like to request Dr. Sahasrabudhi to come forward and give his remarks. Thank you, Urmashi ji, and uh, thanks to all those uh, very revered persons who are present in this particular uh, uh, brainstorming session, if I may describe it that way. And thanks to the foundations, including the Sunday Guardian Foundation and other organizations who have joined hands to deliberate upon uh, one of the key issues that are haunting, in a way, the humanity world over. And uh, uh, without uh, discussing them, deliberating upon them, and uh, coming out with some kind of a consensus-based approach, but for the larger good, wherein uh, the interest of the humanity is uh, uh, paramount, I think uh, we cannot really speaking uh, meet with the challenges uh, that are staring before all of us. Uh, I'm happy that uh, while we are discussing democracy, pluralism, uh, there seems to be a growing uh, realization uh, world over that uh, for every kind of democracy, uh, you have to have a give and take approach. Democracy by definition is certainly the negation of my way or highway. It is accommodation, it is resilience, it is flexibility. And uh, in that sense, I believe, discussing this particular issue, which has global dimensions from India and with Indian uh, participation in a major way, certainly has its own importance. Because uh, as a student of democracy, as a student of social science, I believe that uh, India stands tall amongst the committee of nations and uh, amongst a whole lot of democratic countries, if I may describe them, because some of them are not true democracies, some of them are namesake democracies, but whatever it is. In this particular scenario, India stands tall essentially because of what I describe as spiritual democracy. Because in India, we always have been rejecting every idea of monopolism insofar as spiritual practices are concerned. I'm a member of the parliament, and when I enter the upper house of Indian parliament, I come across uh, a board which tells me Ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti, which means the truth is one, but the wise men describe it in their own ways and therefore differently. But the truth is one. This is the essential thing. And unless and until the entire 
international community commits itself to the acceptance of this principle, not simply because it has originated from India, but it is an eternal truth. And perhaps the most wise approach, I believe we cannot have what I describe as sustainable pluralism. Spiritual democracy, according to my understanding, is the sole guarantor of sustainable pluralism. Because in spiritual democracy, you never say that your path towards the supreme element, one may call it God, Bhagavan, Allah, or whatever it may be, the path has to be the only path which you prefer, and all other paths are invalid and therefore unacceptable. This particular philosophy, this particular approach, this particular doctrine, I believe, has caused innumerable conflicts in the history of the global community. In fact, many a times I believe that uh, world over we have several forums created time to time after coming together of different nations. We have NATO, we have SATO, we have UNCTAD, we have G this, we have G that, we have G70, we have G6, we have G20, we have ASEAN, we have BRICS, so on and so forth. And no objection to them. But as a student of international relations, many a times, I cannot help but think that while most of these forums are about either the security issues or economic issues. But the problems that humanity is facing essentially are about culture. And unfortunately, none of these forums are able to find out the approach for peaceful coexistence while adhering to the path which you have selected in a true democratic spirit for your own. Unless and until we therefore accept democracy as a principle, even in spiritual context, cultural context, I believe we will not be able to have an enduring pluralism, not only sustained, but also flourished all over the world. And therefore, this particular approach, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vadanti, is the foundational statement of spiritual democracy, if I may suggest so. Now, when it comes to terrorism and uh, elements that are wanting to thrust upon the humanity, their own viewpoints, I think it requires to be take, told to them in no uncertain terms. And I'm very happy there was a similar reference in the speech by, my, by the predecessor who spoke just before me, that simply to accommodate, we cannot accommodate, which in itself is unaccommodable. Democracy doesn't mean that each thing and everything is valid. Certainly not. Each thing and everything is valid, only if you accept the validity of the others. Simply because we are democratic, we cannot accept elements which confront with the democratic principle. Simply because we are accommodative, we cannot accept those who are not ready to accommodate others. And therefore, it is the duty of the international community to come clean and to tell those who want to impose their ideas, who want to impose their spiritual thinking upon the entire world that please do not impose your ideas, taking undue advantage of the democratic spirit. Democracy doesn't mean that we will allow space to those who are cross opponents of democracy. And therefore, unless and until we gather courage to tell this, I'm afraid 
we cannot have sustainable pluralism. Lastly, I must also say that those who believe in this idea of spiritual democracy, who reject, who abhor any kind of monopolistic approach in so far as spiritual and cultural issues are concerned, I believe we'll have to come together. It is the weakness of those who are the right thinking elements of the society is providing the space for those who are thinking in a negative and wrong way. And therefore, all those right thinking elements, organizations, individuals, governments, everybody will have to come together and collectively gather strength to tell in no uncertain terms to those who want to impose any kind of spiritual monopolism over the world, over the global community, that no matter how democratic we are, we will not be allowing this nonsense to move any further. With this, I thank the organizers for having allowed me to share my thoughts here and invited me and uh, given me this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much. I would like to, uh, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Sahasrabudhi for your remarks, highlighting our common concerns, the power of accommodation and a flexible approach to, uh, towards achieving our common goals. Dr. Sahasrabudhi had, has also spoken on the importance of spiritual democracy in our cultures and its role in strengthening our ties and approach to, towards solving our common problems. Thank you, sir, for ex uh, uh, accepting our invitation and expressing your views freely uh, on uh, the issues that concern our democracies today. Thank you. Moving forward, I'd like to extend uh, a warm welcome to our next speaker, Gail Hamilton, who is a senior specialist for interreligious and community peace building, Global Peace Foundation. Ms. Hamilton has worked in the nonprofit sector for more than 25 years, has served as an educator, mediator in international conflict situations, and convener of interreligious networks and engagements. She lived and worked in Africa for eight years, serving in the mission and humanitarian aid fields. Her passion for peace is rooted in difficult experiences during the war in Zimbabwe, the military coup in Kenya, and the aftermath of the genocide in Rwanda. Ms. Hamilton was instrumental in establishing the humanitarian aid organization Women for Women in uh, Rwanda in 1997. I'd like to extend a warm welcome and request Ms. Gail Hamilton to come forward and say a few words. Thank you so much, Dr. Pandit. And thank you to the Sunday Guardian Foundation for this opportunity. I am honored to welcome our first session panel entitled Addressing Extremism as it, at its Roots, Strategies Based on Shared Values. This panel will examine the important role and policy implications of universal ideals and shared values as the underpinning for civilizational consensus and resonance within and among the highly diverse nations of South Asia and the Indo-Pacific region. The present Afghanistan crisis and future of civilizational shared values, including freedom in civil society that respects the rights of women and families is a key case in point, which touches many nations. Today, we'll examine this topic with a wealth of insight from three noted leaders in the arena of engaging faith in peace building. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Masudi Saud, Chairman of the Executive Board of Nadatul Lama, Indonesia's largest Muslim organization with a membership numbering more than 50 million. Dr. Saud is also Chairman of numerous Indonesian Muslim institutions, including the Central Board of Cooperation and Harmony among the followers of religious organizations. A longtime GPF partner, Dr. Mursudi is an international authority on addressing extremism with the unique values of Panchasila 
embodied in Indonesia's traditional culture. Welcome, Dr. Masudi. Thank you, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Blessing and peace of Allah be upon with you all. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Salatu wassalamu ala asrafil anbiya wal mursalin. Sayyidina wa maulana Muhammadin sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Happy audience, ladies and gentlemen. Alhamdulillah, I am very happy now to join this uh, Global Peace Foundation Forum. And now we are going to talk and to answer the two questions that already given to me. The first is how can nation address religious extremism while at the same time safeguarding freedom of religion and conscience? And this is the lesson learned from Indonesia the effectively dealing with the extremism implication and strategies for the current crisis in Afghanistan. Because Nahdlatul Ulama, and I am as the one of the German, already helped long time during 2010 uh, help the Afghanistan to sit together. And the second, we are going to answer what are the broader common interests that can be addressed through mutually beneficial collaboration among democratic nations in South Asia and Indo-Pacific. Indo -Pacific. For this, actually, to overcome terrorism and radicalism cannot be only handled by the government, but requires competent and legitimate parties who have wide network in the community and have moderate religious understanding and teaching, such as uh, Nahdlatul Ulama here in Indonesia, there are more than 80 uh, organization, Muslim or, uh, organization, such as uh, Nahdlatul Ulama, Muhammadiyah, and also Indonesia Ulama Council and other organization. To handle the uh, radicalism or terrorism, actually our government Indonesia uh, established the National Counterterrorism Agency, BNPT, to deal with the terrorism and radicalism in Indonesia, where the task is to increase supervision and prevention of acts of terrorism and radicalism. Next, next slide. PNPT run a number of programs to prevent the emergence and development of radicalism. PNPT, or National Agency for Countering Terrorism, is not is a non-ministerial institution under the coordination of the coordinating ministry for political, legal, and security affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. PNPT was formed after the belly bombing tragedy on 2002 through presidential instruction number, the letter number four of 2000 with the main of countering terrorism. In 2009, the House of Representatives in Indonesia supported the government effort in countering terrorism by recommending, recommending the need to increase the capacity and integration of counterterrorism so that the government need to establish an 
operationally authorized agency in carrying out the task of uh, eradicating and countering terrorism. Actually, BNPT was formed to improve the protection and right of citizen from various threat and acts of terrorism to make the following effort. The effort is number one, de-radicalization. The de-radicalization, PNPT has a de-radicalization directorate that implement de-radicalization policies. There are two strategies in the de-radicalization effort, namely the implementation of de-radicalization in the prisons that already catch by the police and the implementation of de-radicalization in the community. The radicalization in the price and of terrorism conflicts starts from the process of examination, investigation, and detention. In the process of examination, investigation, detention, and trial, PNPT together with related parties like Nahdlatul Ulama seek to identify and classify the target so that the uh, appropriate approach can be determined. If the terrorism conflict is not proven guilty in the court process, he will be written to the community and an approach by the radicalization team in the community will be carried out. This is a Nahdlatul Ulama organization, our organization also joining this. Okay, the second slide. Next. However, if proven guilty by the court, the deradicalization team in the prison will carry out rehabilitation, re-education, and re-socialization. The deradicalization team, like uh, in Nahdlatul Ulama also have a team, to the radical, radicalization team in the prisons carries, carries out a rehabilitation in an reduction program in the prison managed by the Directorate General of uh, Correct, uh, correction at the Ministry of Law and Human Rights. Meanwhile, the resocialization development program is carried out both in prison and in the communities where the terrorism inmates live. After the inmates of terrorism have finished undergoing the coaching period, the inmates are embraced to undergo assimilation in the community. In the process, the deradicalization team outside the prison immediately identified and carried out religious, national, and independence development so that former inmates could live peacefully in society and be economically independent. In 2020, PNPT joining with the many organizations already carried out more than 173 radicalization activities. And it is still going until now, okay? The second, prevention of terrorism. Radicalism in the ideology in cyberspace. And this is also not only government, but also the, the most big organization also joining to overcome this problem. To 
prevention of terrorist radicalism ideology in cyberspace in order to prevent the spread of radicalization, especially among young people, the NPT and the uh, Muslim organization run counter propaganda program through website and social media, TV channel, and build peaceful community network involving young people to prevent the spread of propaganda content via digital content. Furthermore, counter propaganda efforts are also carried out through the media and many media and uh, organization media and also the media from the government and from the group of the people and also with the social media and next slide prevention of the terrorism by involving the community this is the effort to prevent terrorism cannot be carried out uh, unilaterally by the government. There, therefore, BNPT improves the community to be active in the movement to prevent the seeding of terrorism. Community improvement is realized through the terrorism prevention uh, coordination forum. And this is not only in Jakarta, Jakarta, but it is spread for all Indonesia. Okay, next. Next slide. For the, for Synergy was initiated actually, uh, and has the support of 17 minister, not only by one, uh, institution, but also supported by 17 minist ministries, institution, based on the coordinating minister for political, legal, and security affair. So the de-radicalization also there, because uh, in the society, people who work also in the government uh, in the government can also joining the terrorism group okay next protection for the parties related to terrorism not only preventing the development of understanding and acts of foreign of of of, of terrorism bnpt through the Directorate of Protection also protect victim and law enforcement, including witnesses, law enforcement officer, investigator, public uh, prosecutors, and judge who handle terrorism cases. In accordance with the mandates of the terrorism law, the NPT synergize with the witnesses and victim protection agency to identify and grant right in the form of compensation, media, psychological, and physical social assistance to victim of terrorism crime. Okay, next. The NPP or, or the government cooperation mm -hmm. with the religious organization. The government through the BNPC in carrying out its duties, collaboration with the religious organization such as Nahdlatul Ulama, which has national and international <laughs> network and has religious teacher, teachers who have moderate understanding to until the villages to strengthen out uh, deviant ideas and guide them into understanding. 
with this collaboration between BNPP and this religious organization, and actually we are able to answer and to help the people who are interesting and in joining the terrorism group or uh, uh, radicalism one. And uh, however, there are still many shortcomings, the government of Indonesia and also the religious organization until now continue to cooperate with uh, neighboring countries such as uh, Filipina and, 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 and uh, Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand to overcome uh, this problem. And <clears throat> in relation with the Afghanistan, actually, we already uh, helped them during 2010. Maybe on 2010, NATO to, uh, maybe this is the first program for the Afghanistan leader on that time to sit together among them. Because I think before this, they cannot sit together among them. And until now, we still with them. And our organization, Nahdlatul Ulama, also existing in Afghanistan uh, during uh, from the from 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 from, um, from the city until the the, 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 the village, Jumar inshallah. And Dr. this is uh, thank you, Dr. thank you very much. We need to to wrap up, Dr. Marsudi, please. Yes. Uh, yeah, we, we need to um, give the other speakers the opportunity. Okay, we need okay. To thank wrap you, up. thank you. Yes, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Mersudi. We can see that Indonesia is really effectively dealing with extremism. And I'd like to move on to our next speaker, who is Swami Shantatmananda, a revered monk of the Ramakrishna order in India for nearly 45 years who presently heads up the Ramakrishna mission in Delhi. Swama Vivekananda's ideas of character building education compelled him to start a program to awaken children to their full potential through gentle nurturing and guidance. This nascent idea led to a full-fledged awakened citizen program currently running in over 5,500 schools across India. Swami Shantatmananda has been an esteemed friend and partner of GPF in the peace building field. Welcome, Swami Shantatmananda. Um, you need to, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityorma Amritangamaya. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Leaders from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, and from death to immortality, Om, peace, peace, peace. It's really a wonderful occasion. I've been associated with the Global Peace Foundation for a number of years. I'm really aware of the wonderful work they are doing in promoting peace all over the globe. All over the globe. And in addition, it's so nice to learn that the Sunday Garden Foundation has joined hands with them in this wonderful initiative. While I present my ideas, already Professor Nalapath and also Dr. Shastra Budde has referred to some of those ideas. Perhaps we have to repeat them, but then there's no harm in repeating such wonderful ideas. As it was stated earlier, the problem of addressing terrorism Really, it has not been a problem at all in this country. Because today we talk about the constitution, we talk about uh, democratic values, but, uh, which, which talks about a secular constitution, a secular country where every religion has equal right or every follower of every religion uh, has equal right to practice his faith. But you know, this has been in vogue for thousands of years. The original idea, Ekam Sat Vipra Bodha Vadanti, truth is one, the sages call it variously, has been the cornerstone of 
our nation. So much so, wherever people have been driven out from their uh, dwellings, from their places, they've all been welcomed in our country. For example, the Jews, the Parsis, these are all, you know, uh, classical examples where people who could uh, not find place in their own place, in their own country, were accommodated beautifully. In fact, so much so, during partition, the Parsis were offered by the British a minority protection, and they flatly refused. They said, we have been living in this country for uh, ages. We are extremely happy. We don't want any such status. Imagine, this was the response of Parsis. So, you know, but this idea, and also what is uh, rated in your uh, kind of a vision document, which talks about Vasudeva Kutimbakam, the world is a one family. Behind that world is a one family is this idea, because the ultimate idea, the ultimate human goal is a spiritual evolution. That is where one can find unity. That is where one can find a harmony. So, you know, the idea, the ultimate truth is one. Sages have called it variously. Again, leads to the next doctrine, namely, the fundamental duty of humanity, human beings as a class, is to seek that kind of a great spiritual fulfillment where one can find the true meaning and uh, value of existence itself. So, you know, the idea of Vasudeva Kudumbakam is based on a much deeper foundational doctrine which accepts the oneness of humanity itself. How do we feel that we are one family unless there is something common to us, is it not? Strangers can't be part of us, one family. The idea of Vasudeva Kudumbakam is based on the philosophy humanity is essentially one. You know, without so much needs to be talked, there is no time. Even in the brief time that is available, I would like to say, essentially, you know, even across religions, what is the foundational doctrine? We are all, crea all created by an extraordinary God and an ultimate principle. So if all our creations of God, obviously we are all brothers and together, uh, sisters, we are all together. There is a basic oneness because there is a relationship amongst us. The same ultimate principle, ultimate God is called variously, recognized variously. But all of us accept that one ultimate God and principle is a creator. So obviously, even if you say uh, the same God created people in, across the globe, they little differently for some practical purposes, yes, there is an underlying unity or harmony amongst all of us. So, but you know, the point is, let us come to the real brass tacks, the practicality of all these ideas. Unfortunately, you know, when institutions like Global Peace Foundation, etc., when they promote these organizations, uh, these values, many of us also participate. Now, how much is our reach really? The one problem in the world across the globe, when, when you take up any matter, good people, right thing people always take a back seat. They don't come forward. It is time we really assert ourselves. Unless this becomes a huge global movement, where the right-thinking people across the globe join together, join hands, propagate this idea in a more effective way, will always be a minuscule minority. Somewhere someone speaking a few words in a, such a beautiful conference, that's not going to reach down to the level of the masses. Apart from that, although we talk of great religious harmony and all that, I have always been advocating this idea in many forums. You know, such a group, such a group of people from different faiths, believing in this harmony, should go together and address the masses. Supposing, you know, some of us in this gathering today, supposing we go and address people who have gathered in a church, the masses, or the people who have gathered in a mosque, that is where these ideas would really take root. Otherwise, highly educated people, enlightened people, intellectually oriented people, for them, these were values, these ideas need not be propagated at all. These are need to be said more at the grassroots level. That's very important. So, you know, there are two approaches. One is the individual level where all of us gather. We, we enlarge our number. We propagate this very strongly. So much so at one point of time, we should have the capacity even to influence governments. And further than that, if necessary, even bring down governments who promote disharmony, division, and so on. That should be the kind of strength we should be talking about. I'm sure one day it will come about. So, you know, as a nation, India has never had any problem at all. Our constitution is a very, of a very recent origin, but it's thousands and thousands of years of history. Here and there, maybe 
be some uh, stray incident might happen, but then our people are ever watchful. Immediately, we try to address those issues. India has, has never been a problem. It will never be a problem. Whosoever might hit the government, whichever, might, whichever party might be in power. So that's not a problem. But then, you know, what is happening globally? What's happening everywhere? Governments, essentially, they are relegating all these issues to beautiful groups like GPF and others. You keep talking. We will keep doing our business. You know, many of the huge wars, for example, the wars that were fought in Africa, in Afghanistan, mainly two big powers. They are deeply involved. So, you know, unless the countries, the governments, people at the government are involved in such debates and deliberations, things will not really happen at the uh, grassroots level. Today, you know, even if you talk about the United uh, Nations, we have a security council that's completely controlled by countries with veto power. How can you talk of uh, veto power in a democracy? Five nations trying to determine the fate of the entire world? This United Nations is going to become a, a absolutely, a, a, absolutely a worthless tool, so to say, in time to come. Because in a true democracy, everybody should have a voice. A few nations can't dictate terms for others. So, you know, supposing if you really look at it in a global sense, whether it is Afghanistan or it's in other places, the countries, you know, with interests other than culture, now say our Dr. Sassabudi rightly pointed out, culture should be a major uh, factor, but then largely economic factors simply override, run over, kind of, uh, you know, really they are sweeping aside the cultural and other needs and requirements of humanity, and because their main concern is economy. Huge wars are fought somewhere, some economies are thriving because huge arms in, in unimaginable quantities are being sold. So, you know, we have a humongous task, but, you know, let us not feel put off by the task before us. Let us do our best. Let us join hands, strengthen this. But then at the same time, ultimately, you know, the real, the real goal, the real ultimate view should be the spiritual redemption of mankind itself. That's what Swami when he said, each soul is potentially divine the goal is to manifest his divinity. And he, he, is, he has followed it up with various methodologies, how it can be done through yoga and so on. But essentially, he says, this is what would lead to the ultimate freedom of humanity. The recognizing the inherent divinity in each one of us, and then the effort to manifest. So, you know, these kind of doctrines, whatever is expressed even in the forums of religious harmony, they are, you know, they are at one level, definitely they are slowly influencing but then, you know, forums like us, we should become stronger so as to involve governments in such deliberations. So that government, they do not sell away their souls. They do not sell away cultures for the sake of economy. You know, today we know one of our neighbors is usually involved in terrorist activities. But then how do they get so much international funding? How is it possible? So, you know, unless nations work effectively, join hands, We'll have more and more such Afghanistans, Pakistans, and so many other countries will be constantly promoting terrorism because they have taken us first views. Such countries are being armed, they are being sponsored, they are being heavily aided. So probably, you know, through such forums, let us bring about a greater awareness. One is at the micro level and expanded to a huge number of individuals across the globe in several countries. Supposing, you know, Global Peace Foundation one day has billion members probably will be have a huge strength to even tackle governments. And then slowly in, deli in deliberations, dialogues and discussions, can we really tag, involve governments also? So as to ultimately gain so much of effective power, so to say, the ability to control situations where you can even say to tell governments this would not work, you have to change your methodology. So, you know, probably, you know, the other way is to uh, mean kind of influence individual citizens build up a huge community across the globe committed to these values, whereby they'll be able to reflect it in their power, in their mandate to vote. At the time, we have throw out governments which are selling their souls, which are relegating culture to the background and involving money in economic issues. A lot more needs to be said. There's no time. Of course, our friends, uh, Mr. Jim, our uh, Gail and others, they are such wonderful beings, such wonderful personalities. GPS is doing a great work. Let's all join together. Let's support each other and take it and make it a huge global movement so that we are really will be armed with such kind of 
ability, such kind of negotiating power to even talk to nations, even to talk to governments. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much, Swami Shantatmananda. He has really given us the charge to assert ourselves. Thank you for uh, telling it like it is and giving us such a, a, broad, a broad view. Uh, I would like to, to move on to our last speaker, uh, who is Azar Hussein, the president of Peace and Education Foundation. He conceived and led a Pakistan madrasa project working in partnership with various civic and religious organizations and the United States Institute of Peace. It supported expansion of madrasa curriculum to include scientific and social disciplines, religious freedom, tolerance and human rights, as well as critical thinking and peace building skills among 15,000 students trained to date. He has also been contributing author with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in, in Washington. And welcome, welcome, Azi. Hello, assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon all of you all. And uh, I, I think there is not much to say after uh, <laughs> the honorable speakers have spoken. There is so much uh, great stuff there. I think everything that I'll say would be a repetition. Um, but I like, like the like, last speaker, sometimes repeating is not a bad thing. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep it short also, uh, because I think I, I'm mindful of the time. Uh, and uh, I, I'll, what drives people to, to extremism? What are the root causes? That was one of the topics, that was a topic given to us. And, and uh, we have done a lot of research on this, a lot of field work and actually implemented some of the um, actions on the, on the ground uh, in many different countries, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nigeria, and other countries as well. And um, we found uh, some, there are many uh, reasons, but uh, we found desire for meaning and purpose and a set of order uh, is, is one of the things that was, that was needed in extremist groups who felt that there was um, somehow the meaning was missing, or uh, especially the social order. They, they desire a social order that's pretty strict. Um, and um, uh, that, that, that includes Muslims, um, but also, uh, and I, we found the determination of democracy had little to do with it, to be honest because I work on uh, democratic reforms a lot too, because um, in the West, white supremacist movement uh, with, uh, with a pretty, pretty mature democracy, we still find that sense of meaning and lack of order, or, or at least from their perspective that everything is kind of falling, up, uh, <laughs> falling apart and, and they're losing their, their culture or their identity. Um, uh, I think those, uh, uh, those tend to have a marginalizing impact on communities and then they react towards a, a system, whether it's a democratic system or, uh, or a not democratic system. Harder to act against non-democratic system because autocratic and can, it can harm people a lot. So um, usually you'll see a lot of this in, in actually democracies. Uh, uh, poverty and lack of education are cited as one of the reasons for extremism, individual turning to extremism or communities. And uh, based on our research, um, <clears throat> many countries who are very, very poor, um, uh, remarkably we have less extremism or at least violent extremism. They might have different types of extremism. Um, lack of education also does not correlate uh, directly to extremism um, per, per se. Uh, lack of ignorance, yeah, <laughs> that because people don't understand their constitution, people don't understand human rights, people don't understand UN Charter of Human Rights. Those are, um, but the, the, the education is not defined that way currently. Education is defined as being able to read and write <laughs> and able to understand letters. So, uh, 
education tends to not, but ignorance of systems, ignorance of ideological systems like democracy or uh, their own religion, I think tend to drive people towards uh, ex extremism a lot. And that's why there is a, a school of thought that, that really encourages religious leaders, whether we are Sikhs or Hindus or Muslims or Christians, to, because they are closest to the communities, to raise that level of literacy, what we call it a, a social, communal and uh, systems literacy within the community to be able to, um, to, be able to counter uh, radicalization and extremism. Uh, opinion leaders, uh, media, uh, like uh, Indonesian, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Nadatul Ulma chairperson so articulately expressed, I think those programs have really incredibly worked and can be a best practices in Indonesia um, where they have used media and uh, social media and prison reforms and, and actually religious institutions uh, to start the reform and start to target extremism. And it's been very successful. Um, uh, grievances and justice is also uh, a major, major cause of extremism or individual turning towards uh, extremism is uh, grievances and, and perceived injustice. And we notice that um, the grievances come from lack of, lack of inclusivity, um, um, a lot of marginalization um, that is perceived by a group of people that comes from the state itself. So if the state is start to side with one group, uh, one dominant religious group or one dominant ethnic group or one dominant racial group, the other groups uh, feel extremely marginalized and some parts of that group becomes quite radicalized. Uh, so grievances based on inclusivity is a, is a major issue that democracies and other countries actually fail face at this point. Um, uh, and injustice, obviously, just a system of justice is quite um, complicated topic. And, and uh, uh, many of the extremists that we interviewed from Africa all the way to Bangladesh and Afghanistan and Pakistan, Nigeria, um, and even in the United States, um, well, injustice tend to mean it takes forever <laughs> to create justice. Uh, the, the regular court system, um, whether it's in West or whether it's in Pakistan, seem to take a long time. The process is overburdensome. And that creates sense of injustice that even if I go to the court system, um, there is not going to be uh, justice for me uh, or for what I have, uh, my grievances. Um, so, I, I, I also um, I, I also understand a great desire from politicians or I think you know leaders and, and governments to not accommodate their communities that have grievances, and I think a lot of extremism stems from that non accommodation, not able to listen to their grievances, not able to respond to their grievances in an effective way. If the, if the complaints and grievances are um, extremely unreasonable, that is, uh, and sometimes they are, most, most of the time extremist grievances and complaints are unreasonable, then, then there is other tools. Uh, uh, that, that's, that's number one sign of gap analysis of saying there's a lack of education ignorance, obviously, around understanding the systems. And we need to do a lot more work with these communities and develop community engagement programs where people can really understand what the, our system is um, providing for people, for example, constitutional rights or uh, democracy and things of that sort. When we become impatient and, and think that they are being so unreasonable um, and uh, we end up using kinetic force like military or or, or law enforcement sometimes, um, what we have noticed is that that only adds to more 
more extremism and, and a larger network of extremists, in fact. Um, we've been following 28 extremist groups and uh, since 2004. And out, out of 28, um, uh, 17 terrorist groups, extremist groups were under a lot of attacks from military and um, they have uh, almost all of them have grown more. So billions of dollars. And then <laughs> what we see is that kinetic response, only kinetic response does not, does not work. Of course, if there is a criminal that have done some um, violence and all that, the law enforcement should take them, uh, should take action. Uh, but military response we find is not sufficient to uh, sustainably reduce extremism. Uh, it infects, increases it based on our, uh, our work. Um, there are lots of strategies that I don't have really time to go to, but um, <clears throat> a lot of their narrative, been, extremist narrative has been, uh, if you can only follow our moral code, whether it's a religious code or some other, and it, it comes uh, from Myanmar, uh, Myanmar of, uh, from monks to uh, Islamic uh, extremist groups, uh, to Hindu extremist groups, to Christian extremist groups as well. Mm, the narratives seem to be, if you only follow these very simple rules that uh, our particular faith has given you, then we wouldn't, then we wouldn't have extremism. And if people or communities don't follow those simple, simple rules, then then these groups become very, very um, agitated and ex extreme. W one example that you see is Taliban right now, where they think that if everybody just follows very simple rules based on their understanding of Islam, then then everything will be fine. And I think that's a, it's a, it's a very simplistic uh, thinking and a lot of religious and faith groups tend to have that, uh, um, th that those, those things and they, they go, they rail against the system. Um, another narrative we found is that current system has to be overthrown or pushed back uh, and completely destroyed. A uh, new revolution needs to come to create a new moral a uh, purpose and peaceful life um, for, for our people, for Muslims, uh, for, for Hindus. In order for us to have peaceful life, we need to have that very simplistic uh, uh, code of ethics. Everybody has to believe it uniformly in order for us to be able to, uh, to, to, be able to live in, live in peace. And in order for, you, for us to do that, the current system has to be overthrown. Uh, so those are those are the kind of narratives. There's lots of recommendations and a lot of programs that that we that we that we uh, implement a, in the field that causes that um, that has uh, demonstrable results in reducing uh, uh, extremism and 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 terrorism and uh, usually all of those are done through education and peace building activities and um, a, a narrative and counter narratives um, mm. Mm. develop thank you very much i appreciate it i'm sorry if i took a little bit more time than i thought well thank you so much uh, dr Hu dr hussein thank you so much for all all of our panelists are so wonderful and um, have stimulated us to to be more inclusive and more uh, working more for justice, finding justice that doesn't take forever and more educational systems. So we have had a call to action uh, from all of our panelists and we're really very, very grateful. So I'd like to uh, hand it back over to Dr. Pandit and um, we will proceed. Please stay tuned for our next session, which I'm sure will be also uh, very interesting and uh, uh, we all can learn a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Dr. Pandit. Thank you. So I think we can leave now. Huh? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Gail and the panelists uh, for a very enriching and lively session uh, that we had today. Our second panel is titled uh, Strengthening Regional Collaboration Towards Peace, Security, Freedom, and Human Rights. 
I would like to hand over to Professor Madhav Nalapat, who is the moderator for the session. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Nalapat. Please proceed. Uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll try very hard to ensure that we uh, end this on time. Uh, I, I only want to say that, I, that these are uh, wonderful discussions. And uh, I have long been a believer in, in, the in a universal peace, like universal human rights, universal values, universal peace. But for that, the problem is you need perfect understanding and knowledge of each other. Now you have uh, the so-called free market economies. They are, the economics textbooks say, that uh, there is perfect knowledge, perfect knowledge of the market, perfect knowledge of how many consumers, how many producers, and where they're located. But there is no perfect knowledge and there is no perfect understanding. So the, therefore, and then we are talking now in terms of freedoms. In, for example, freedom of speech. I am a very strong, uh, if I may say so, uh, enthusiast of the United States First Amendment, recognizing that a lot of people, may, you may say things which other people may not like. Well, that's fine. But if you are a, a, the kind of individual who says, you know, I am free to criticize you, but you're not free to criticize me. I am free to criticize your value systems. You're not free to criticize my value systems. Well, that is really not on. You have to have a certain reciprocity. So if you believe in freedom of speech, it's also freedom of speech, not only to hurt others, but I mean, not in a physical sense, but in terms of a belief sense. And I think the, it should also be in polite language, but to get uh, you know, in polite language, uh, 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 knocks on your own belief system. If you say that my belief system is absolutely off the table, you can't attack it, but your belief system is on the table, I'll attack it left, right, and center. Well, frankly, that is not democracy, that is not reciprocity. I simply want to begin this by, by pointing to one fact that has been brought out here. We seem to respect people, and I think the United States and India joined uh, uh, jointly in this are guilty based on the number of zeros in their bank account, not on the number on the good they do, not on the way these zeros are distributed across needy elements of society, but simply by the zeros in their bank account. I think that's a wrong way of looking at people, a wrong way of judging people. And therefore, I think even we as the big democracies have a lot to learn. Having said that, let me hand over the mic to Dr. Parker. Dr. William Parker, who is one of the top strategic minds in the United States. Dr. Parker, welcome. Dr. Parker. Thank you for your kind introduction and thank you to the Global Peace Foundation and the Sunday Guardian Foundation of New Delhi for generously hosting this forum, which is focused on finding a path forward to achieve a values-based consensus in South Asia and the Indo-Pacific. Unquestionably, one of the great challenges the world faces today is maintaining peace and security in the Indo-Pacific and doing so in a manner that addresses the potential growth of both extremism and authoritarianism. To be successful in this quest, all instruments of national and international power must be considered and used where and when appropriate to shape this complex environment in a manner acceptable to the inhabitants of the region and those who rely on these global commons for trade, security, and freedom of movement. With this in mind, we must do our very best to find common interests between nations that may not otherwise agree on a variety of issues ranging from security to governance, to religious and personal freedoms, to fundamental approaches to the economy. If necessary, the United States and our allies must deter those who are considering challenging the freedoms most of the world expects and the United States and our allies demand. And the United States and our allies must be prepared to defend these freedoms through the earlier mentioned instruments of power. It is my strongest belief that seeking common ground wherever possible by communicating clearly, consistently, and directly through governments or through Track 2.0 and 1.5 initiatives with organizations like the Global Peace Foundation and the Sunday Guardian Foundation of New Delhi is imperative to successful and peaceful engagement. Additionally, only by negotiating from a position of moral, ethical, economic, and military power 
will our efforts result in the outcome the world so richly deserves. I believe to my core that words matter. And conversely, these same words mean nothing if they are not backed by action. It is imperative that the United States and our allies consistently demonstrate to ourselves, our allies and friends, and our potential adversaries that our word means something. If we say we will stay and fight alongside our friends and allies, we must do just that. If we say we will leave no man behind, those men and women know that they will not be left. And if we have an agreement with you, whether business, diplomatic or military, that agreement stands the test of time and changes in administrations. Without strict adherence to these simply stated promises, all the treaties, agreements, palace meetings and public promises mean nothing. The Indo-Pacific is a vast expanse of the globe, including 36 nations speaking 3,200 different languages, and it represents five of the seven U.S. collective defense treaties. South Asia, on the other hand, is home to nearly two billion people, or one quarter of the global population. It covers nearly 4% of the world's landmass and includes eight nations, including India. But the world is more complex than just pure numbers. Leaders matter. 82 years ago, the world experienced an overly confident, tyrannical dictator who desired to fashion the world in a form unimaginable by the masses. The slow reacting free world eventually prevailed, but only after the loss of nearly 80 million lives from war, disease, and famine. Now, I am not suggesting that Xi Jinping is another Hitler, but the time has long passed for the world to address the issues at hand. Since Xi Jinping assumed the position of General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party and Chairman of the Central Military Commission in 2012 and President of the People's Republic of China in 2013, his nation has become significantly more aggressive, influential, and powerful on the world stage. China has moved to reassert over Hong Kong immediately and has built strategic bases over man-made islands in the South China Sea. As early as 2019, Xi stated that the people of Taiwan are urged to accept that, quote, Taiwan must and will be reunited with China, unquote. And while China has grown in confidence, military capacity, and economic strength over the past two decades and is enjoying its new position of power as it celebrates the Chinese Communist Party's 100th anniversary, the world is not sleeping as it was in 1939. The United States and Japan have developed complex planning activities for the defense of Taiwan. Japan's deputy prime minister has openly stated that the US and Japan must stand together against China. Additionally, and despite the embarrassingly ill-conceived and even poor execution of the Afghanistan withdrawal, which left the world shocked, Afghanis and Americans stranded and allies dismayed, the United States remains the most powerful and influential military and economy in the world. Additionally, the United States has made clear that in recent years, it has shifted focus to the Indo-Pacific to include the monumental step of renaming the Pacific Command to the Indo-Pacific Command, and more recently signing a trilateral defense pact known as AUKUS between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States formulating a multitude of diplomatic, technological, and military cooperation agreements to include Australia obtaining a fleet of nuclear-powered submarines. Additionally, the 2007 formation of the Quad of the US, India, Japan, and Australia should not be underestimated. And this point was reinforced when Australia and India were invited as guests to the most recent G7 where the US and Japan are already members. But China is a near peer competitor and will likely become another great power soon. And since anniversaries are so important to the Chinese, I don't think anyone should be surprised if major strides in technology like space travel to Mars or changes in geostrategic efforts like the invasion of Taiwan may happen before the PLA's 100th anniversary in 2027. In fact, it is within this context that in 2020, the Defense Strategic Update of Australia stated that strategic uncertainty is greater now than at any time since the 1930s, 
mostly due to the military growth and economic pressures being applied by China. In fact, Xi's October 18th, 2017 address to the 19th National Congress of the Communist Party of China clearly articulates his China dream of which a rejuvenated China is made whole only once Hong Kong and Taiwan are fully brought back into the fold of mainland China. And while China measures success in centuries, not election cycles, it clearly smells blood in the water resulting from the debacles in Afghanistan withdrawals, lack of confidence and publicly demonstrated violence from US voters in 2020, failure to tamp down COVID, struggles on America's southern border, the imminent replacement by, of the US by China as the world's largest economy, and all while longtime American allies, the, the United Kingdom and France, publicly denounced the leadership of the United States for reasons of Afghanistan and the impact on France's economy as a result of AUKUS. Still, the United States and our allies are militarily and economically strong, and when focused and aligned, remain a dauntless foe to any competitor. So in closing, the United States and its allies must take a few critical steps to ensure the vision of a value-based consensus in the South Asia and the Indo-Pacific becomes a reality. First, the United States and our allies must continue to shape the environment by all means at our disposal. We must strengthen our relationships with our friends and allies while simultaneously ensuring China that we can live together peacefully as long as certain security and societal norms are maintained. Consistent and thoughtful messaging through track 1.0, 1.5 and 2.0 is essential to this success. Again, the United States and our allies must take actions that clarify that what we say will be followed with what we do. Second, we must deter China and its friends and allies from crossing specific security and societal norms by maintaining overwhelmingly superior military and economic capabilities with consistent application and messaging. These norms must be clearly articulated and consistent across administrations and borders of our allies. And finally, the United States and our allies must maintain the economic and military strength, as well as sage diplomatic and executive leadership to ensure both sides of the potential conflict understand the horrific outcomes likely if certain norms are crossed. Again, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this very important issue with you today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Parker, for this very uh, accurate, if I may say so, assessment of situation. You've highlighted the, the problems posed by the assertiveness and the, and the military-centric policy of the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, also Afghanistan. Uh, some of us have predicted before Afghanistan fell to a Taliban through a series of mistakes, uh, that if the Taliban were to take control of government, it will be like the Nazis in 1933. They will grab all levers of power, eliminate everybody else. And that is what has happened. And unfortunately, there are individuals less clear thinking than you, uh, where you are, and where uh, some of uh, uh, others are who are forgetting. In 1996, the Taliban gave the exact same kind of, 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 if I may say so, narrative. Oh, we have changed, we are moderate, we will accommodate everybody. And then you know what happened. And you know exactly what happened and uh, what it resulted in, including 9-11. Today, they're giving the same narrative. And unfortunately, uh, once again, a lot of people are falling for that narrative. I don't want to take any more of the time. I've got, uh, you know, I've got Dr. Jagannath Panda, who's also an outstanding strategic mind. And Jagannath, I'd like you now to take the floor. Thank you, esteemed chairperson. Um, let me at the outset uh, thank uh, Global Peace Foundation and the Sunday Guardian Foundation for this excellent uh, invitation and panel. The theme of this conference is value-based consensus in South Asia and Indo-Pacific. Um, and uh, I must compliment the organizer and excellent panel, uh, you know, to share their uh, understanding on the issues. And certainly this is, these regions, particularly South Asia, need a value-based consensus. With this background, let me start by saying that building a consensus is always a difficult enterprise in a highly contested region. 
be it in south asia or the bigger platform of indo pacific and uh, uh, you know uh, honorable uh, chairperson rightly pointed out that we need a much more debate and dialogue prone environment here uh, to beat the authoritarian practices and we need to promote democratic sentiments and spirits in order to you know build this consensus but what is actually more difficult is to build a consensus on value or have a common agenda to share these values and therefore we need to talk each of these regions specifically if we talk about south asia there are three strategic contestation that is posing challenge to a value based consensus to build a stronger and united south asia at present the first is there is a tensions there is a contest between peace and violence if we if we see the region of south asia there is a uh, for last two to three decades the region has faced enormous sponsor of terrorism and this practice of terrorism has been you know promoted by the autocratic leaderships in pakistan and uh, you know some of this terrorism has been cross border terrorism to which india has steadfastly opposed and uh, you know uh, fight singularly with uh, with with many you know um, uh, with with the many um, you know uh, many of its uh, soldiers and its uh, population sacrificing uh, to fight the terrorism at the same time india's approach on the issue of terrorism has expanded we have seeked partnerships we have seeked you know um, we have uh, looked for a much more security oriented partnership and cooperation to fight with sponsored terrorism and therefore when we are today talking about afghanistan and the situation in afghanistan we need to keep it in mind as uh, the chairperson rightfully you know pointed out there is nothing ch changing on on the on the issue of taliban the, the today's taliban is probably not uh, in any way different from the earlier taliban the taliban in 1996 to 2001 is very much the same taliban what we are seeing the, there are terrorist groups radical groups are still linked with the taliban 2.0 that we are seeing today so unless the um, the taliban groups which has assumed power and formed the interim government in afghanistan uh, today they try to disassociate from the radical groups from the terrorist groups that has sponsored terrorism over the years um, you know the regions and the countries should not be supportive of such taliban the second issue is i think more problematic which is the radical revisionist approach of many countries including china and there are a kind of a peaceful revisionist approach that many countries like us and india follow in other words there is a tensions and contest between authoritarian practices um, or unilateral practices and then on the other hand we are seeing democratic or uniform or or universal practices and i think we need to uh, build pressure on china not only in south asia but also in indo pacific in order to check china's revisionist practices and revisionist approaches the third tension that we are seeing that there is a politics surrounding over the resource the energy resources over the economic resources over the land and territorial resources that is actually creating fissure over social uh, inequality uh, uh, social equality and therefore we need to address social tensions and social inequality which is arising because of the land and territorial contestation and because of the resource politics moving into the indo pacific i think i do agree with the previous speaker that there is a lot of contest which is taking place in indo pacific and the rivalry uh, between china and the rest is the major regions and i think when we talk about the major power context the us china rivalry is becoming one of the most contesting point here uh, but at the same time what we have to make a clear choice is to you know sideline with the, the like minded countries support the you know democratic revisionism and support the uh, democratic practices that united states and its allies are promoting and therefore we need a strong india us partnership in the regions to contest with china the second thing is in china india dynamic and i think china is facing both so china's uh, you know mining territorial land claim in the regions is a is a is a issue that needs to be debated and we need to be really very clear headed part to face china but there is a consensus emerging between china pakistan and uh, 
my um, uh, my uh, presentation is that there is a maritime politics which is emerging and china is clearly emerging as a revisionist maritime power we need to check and probably contest china's uh, unilateral uh, you know maritime revisionist practices that it is engaging in terms of building ports and building you know stationing points in the in the indo pacific regions and making smaller maritime powers Uh, to become debt oriented and i think the debt practices that is the chinese uh, belt and road initiatives are promoting in the region that needs to be opposed and therefore we need to really focus on you know b3w initiatives built back, back better world initiatives blue dot network initiatives in order to check china's belt and road initiatives so therefore i would conclude by saying that uh, you know probably this contest and contradictions are going to prevail and uh, there is no immediate solution to it but if we really are serious in in terms of finding a long term solution we need to promote a human centric approach to build a consensus that will be a value based consensus in indo pacific for that we need to focus more on transparent and resilient infrastructure and therefore we need to uh, form a like minded alliance uh, and both india and us can take a lead on this we need to promote people to people contact we need to respect religion and humanity we need to strengthen democracy and oppose authoritarian rules and authoritarian regimes and promote most importantly dialogues and uh, above all of these things uh, the last point that we need to nurture in the region is you know quality education and quality livelihood i think that are key to the uh, you know promotion of a free fair uh, and resilient indo pacific region i stop here and thank you for listening to me i welcome your comments thank you very much chair person sir thank you very much uh, second half for that i am uh, i mean again a very accurate diagnosis following on from dr parker and uh, and again a, a very clear assessment of what needs to be done uh, for the cure uh, i don't really like say the 1930s uh, people, the countries were not asleep they simply did not understand the nature of the nazi regime and this is the problem that we are facing today there are many people very good natured people uh, well intentioned people true democrats who do not understand the nature of the combining of extremism and authoritarianism that we are seeing in the world today we are seeing an alliance now of extremism and authoritarianism and this alliance is much more deadly than either of them working together thank you uh, dr panda for your analysis now i'd like to turn to dr paul murray who is well known in the field of uh, uh, of freedom of speech and you know he's an expert in the first amendment and i want to welcome uh, dr murray and give him the floor thank you very much i appreciate uh, the time together thank you for this opportunity to listen to these powerful voices who are bound together for such a time as this your efforts are the seeds of hope for humanity now may i take a moment to bring you back to the very beginning you see there is an origin a starting point for us as human beings in creation we can look to this foundational truth that there is only one mold that all human beings were created from it has been through the process of time locations and environments that the exterior features of god's creation have changed into the many shades shapes and features we have in our world today it has been through the establishment of traditions the shaping thoughts and and the growth of a people's faith in a god or higher being or or even the internal development of one's conscience that we have the many diversities of religion and belief and conscience around us yet the blood which runs through every one of our veins and the breath of divine power or consciousness which brought forth our very existence all remains the same so we when we can acknowledge this fundamental truth 
that we are all in one humanity and build upon it, then the many challenges and conflicts between people of diverse faiths or no faith can dissolve away into a people who are bound together by common universal principles. You know, I, uh, I often wonder why we as individuals and communities so easily acquiesce control over our very basic human rights and freedoms to man-made governments and institutions who in turn dictate and, and enforce ideologies that we often find are contrary to what we believe or hold to individually. This freedom of thought that we each have is endowed by a transcendent principled creator. Yet, you know, in my questioning this, I've come to the revelation that the greatest obstacle, the most troubling problems and challenges for people of faith and conscience are not the governments or the human institutions, rather it's each of us. We, a people who hold to our very own individual or shared values of faith and belief. You see, we seek to push one belief as superior to another. We spend millions to gather people together with a purpose to conform them to a particular religion or belief through the process of denouncing the belief or faith of another. We challenge and rebuke the theologies that are not in alignment with our own and with our very own organized power and influence. We use these very same governments and institutions to oppress another minority religion and justify these very actions or we just simply turn a blind eye to it. As a result, Human history is paved with a trail of tears for the lives of the many who have been oppressed, persecuted, and even killed because of their faith or belief. And sadly, the, the future before us has yet to accept this new blueprint that a diverse people of multiple faiths, beliefs, or conscience can engage in the public square and build a moral society upon the common transcendent principles that are foundational to each of our communities of faith, belief, and conscience. This convening today truly highlights where we are as a people. As each of you have spoken from the heart, have shared from your own experience and expertise, I believe that we all can agree that we stand at a crossroads today. However, as long as we see that there is a choice before us, there is hope. If we can individually identify and give voice in the public square, in the space that we have all gathered in right now, if we can give voice, not to our religious banners, rather we give voice to the transcendent universal principles that are common to people of faith and conscience, that we hold to these principles and that it is not only resonant in our minds, but it's in the very marrow of our bones. For example, the value, dignity, and life of every person must always be affirmed. That the value that we do unto others, what we would have them do to us. The very value of just loving one another. You see, this is where we can each identify, celebrate, and give that collective voice, give that clarion call that as one human race, as one human family, as one family under God, that we are holding to a foundational standard that is greater than, that is louder than, that is more powerful than any voice which speaks against these universal and transcendent principles. This is the blueprint. It's simple, yet it's so difficult. Why? Because it challenges the places we have come from and our individual personal faiths and beliefs. For some, it really just shakes the very foundation of what was instilled in them by loving people in their lives. The challenge of using this blueprint calls for us to look beyond the safe structures of our own, our own, of our own institutionalized religion of belief. Yet it does not call for one to negate nor turn from their individual faith, traditions, or belief. Rather, it calls for one to truly embrace it and live out their faith or belief through these values and principles that are foundational to their system and also common in other traditions of faith or belief. <laughs> you know, 
it's through this transformative understanding and are the very building blocks of this blueprint that will lift up freedom of religion as a guarantee for all, regardless of where you live or how you even practice. You know, leaders of faith must truly understand the role that they play and the responsibility they have. As a leader of faith, you are often looked to in many places as that high moral agent of your community. And people will follow whatever you do and whatever you say. You know, in my own faith tradition, the Bible tells me to who much is given, much is required. Therefore, I have a role and a responsibility to live the spiritual principles of affirming the dignity of life of all humans. I have the responsibility of loving my neighbor as I love myself, of living a moral life rooted in truth and righteousness, and to be that peacemaker. Now, this does not mean that we must compromise our own faith. It does not mean that we cannot share our own faith experiences. Rather, it means we must truly live out our faith in a manner that is uplifting to our creator through these transcendent principles. You know, as I close out my remarks, may I be so bold to, as to say, it is not helpful to entertain the thought that your religion is big enough to squash any opposition, because somewhere it's not. It's not helpful even to entertain the thought that the genocide of one religious group could never happen to yours, because history has already demonstrated the error of such a thought. May I also remind each of us that somewhere right now in the world, your faith or your belief is under attack. You see, we've heard it already in the conversations through both panels that knowledge is power. And knowing that, we also know it is why these conversations, these times of sharing, of building relationships, connecting on common grounds are so vital to the realization of this blueprint for the future. And the future is right now. Every second in the present propels us into the next second of our future. And it is incumbent upon each of us to lift our individual torches, which burn with the light of hope and love for all of humanity. It is that light that is on a hill that cannot be hidden. Each of us and the many who are watching right now and will watch, if we lift this light that was ignited within us, this light glowing from our creator's eternal transcendent principles, then no weapon formed against us can prosper. And collectively, as we bring our torches together, we can ignite this world with the flames of love and peace as it burns out all the hatred and the malice around us. You see, we have the solution right before us. We are just being called to boldly join together in the public square for the common good of all humanity. That's where we're at right now. That's what's so important. All of these conversations, all of these points of views come into the public square, but we must understand from the human standpoint where we are, who we are, and whose we are and that there is this universality that comes together, that brings us all together, and that we can truly live out our faith in an expression of love and simplicity that, that allows us to connect one to another in the public square so that extremism and, and, and religious persecution and oppression cannot and will not take hold or continue to grow, but rather can be pushed back as we lift up together these common principles. Thanks so much for allowing me this time to share and may his peace be with each of you. Thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dr. Murray. And I quite agree with you. There has been a long battle against racial supremacy and there needs to be a similar battle against religious supremacy this absurdity of thinking that one particular faith is somehow superior to other faiths, when the reality is, I mean, for example, the Gayatri Mantra is one of the fundamental mantras in Sanatana Dharma. And the Gayatri Mantra talks about the eternal force. 
The only point is, it's not just human beings. Even a small stone, even a bit of dirt, even a, a, a table, a chair, these are all creations of that eternal force. If we are a creation of the eternal force and we create something, well, ultimately, the grandfather is that eternal force. And I'm glad that you have you highlighted that there is one eternal force that actually we are all children of. And that, I mean, I can go back to my, my article of Hindutva about 25 years ago, that the cultural DNA of India is a compound of the Vedic, a compound of the Mughal, and a compound of the Western. All of us have elements of all three cultures in us. And that is something that needs to be celebrated uh, rather than, in a sense, you know, looked down upon. So I'm glad that you made this kind of comment. I, I, I can really share your views. I'm totally opposed to any kind of supremacy, including religious supremacy. And again, I repeat that supposing you have a situation in which you are free to criticize somebody else's faith and beliefs. I mean, some, somebody may believe, somebody may call, uh, you know, uh, 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 revered uh, uh, figures, saints. Others may call them gods. But if you are free to criticize that, but people are not free to criticize you, then they are intolerant. The reality is, as you correctly know, the First Amendment means equal rights to all. So if you give criticism, you have to take criticism. And I think, uh, uh, Dr. Murray, you will agree with me on that, being a strong champion of the First Amendment. I don't want to say anything more, except to say that it's been a very, very enlightening uh, conference. I'm particularly happy about uh, the session that, that uh, uh, I, I moderated, because uh, in Dr. Parker and Dr. Panda, we got a very clear uh, diagnosis of the problem that we are facing as a result of coming together of extremism and authoritarianism. And that's where the question of race comes in. Whether you're it's the Euro race, whether it is the Indic race, whether it's the Han race, no race is superior to any other. And that's where religion comes in. Whether you're a Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Jain, every religion is in a sense equal, because as the Sanatan Dharma says, every path leads to the same eternal force that is commemorated in the Gita. Having said that, and having thanked uh, both uh, Dr. Pandit and, uh, and President Flynn for organizing this wonderful conference, having thanked my fellow participants in both sessions, I'd now like to hand the mic over back to Dr. Aishwarya Pandit. Uh, thank you, Professor, um, uh, and the panelists uh, for a very enlightening uh, discussion. We thoroughly enjoyed both the uh, uh, sessions. I would like to thank all speakers and panelists for taking out time and participating in the conference. I would also like to thank our keynote speaker, Dr. Vinay Sehisrabuddhi, for taking out time and expressing his views on the platform today. I would like to thank our partners, the Global Peace Foundation and the Sunday Guardian Foundation and the teams that have worked tirelessly for making this conference a success. The speakers have discussed the importance of our shared values among different democracies of the world, ideas of freedom of speech from ideas of Indian spirituality, such as the Sanatan Dharm to Vasudev Kutumbakam, and the importance of reciprocal tolerance at all ends of the spectrum have been emphasized in the conference today. Human rights are important for people regardless of their religious outlook, which is crucial for the peace and security and is the path forward in the Indo-Pacific region. The world communities need to work hard toward realizing these goals and respecting each other's faith, which is the very basis of world peace. Thank you once again and have a good week ahead.